Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Both here in this fabulous theater in America House, as well as a warm welcome to our online audience. Although I must say, I am consciously happy of being doing things in person again, and it's so nice to see you all. Um, for those here for the first time, my name is Bartley Grosser-Richter, and I'm the founder of Munich Dialogues on Democracy. Relevant to our evening tonight, I am also the current president of the Yale Club of Germany. So as most of you know, these dialogues are a cooperation between the Yale Club of Germany and Munich's America House. So I can welcome you in their name as well tonight. And the only housekeeping rule I'd like to mention is it would be great if you could all make sure your cell phones are on silent uh, before we get going. Thankfully, we have no other restrictions tonight. So we all want to have as much time as possible with our guests tonight, so I'm gonna cut straight to the chase. Uh, I'm very pleased to be able to welcome you to our second event with Professor Anna Vestad. Professor Vestad studied history, philosophy, and modern languages at the University of Oslo before doing a graduate degree in US and international history at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He joined the faculty at Yale, where he is currently the Elihu Professor of History and Global Affairs, by way of the London School of Economics for two decades, <laughs> and a stint with our friends up in Cambridge, Massachusetts at Harvard. At Yale, he teaches in the History Department and at the Jackson School of Global Affairs, and he serves as Director of International Security Studies. As you might remember from last time Professor Westhead was here, he has published 16 books, most of which deal with 20th century Asian and global history. He's one of the world's leading historians on the Cold War, which he worked on for a significant portion of his career, writing important works about the Soviet bloc and the People's Republic of China. Here in Germany, he's a Spiegel bestseller, so he's got the sticker. And he now specializes, special, no, sorry, specializes in the history of empire and imperialism, as well as China's place in international order. So when we scheduled this program, we could not have known just how incredibly relevant his expertise is to address what's going on around us today. Professor Westad's talk tonight will address the US-China relationship in light of the war in Ukraine. And hopefully we'll have some time to get his two cents on how he sees Germany's role in all of this playing out. And if we're really lucky, maybe we'll have time to talk about what's going on inside China right now also. Then as an extra treat for us tonight, after Professor Westad's talk, which will be about 30 minutes, Ambassador Eric Nelson will join him on stage. He is the Associate Director of the George C. Marshall European Center for Security Studies in Garmisch-Partenkirchen. And uh, he has over 30 years in diplomatic service, with his most recent post being the US Ambassador to Bosnia-Herzegovina. He's a member of the United States Senior Foreign Service with the rank of Minister Counselor. And amongst his many previous postings are Deputy Chief of Mission in Costa Rica and Consul General right here in Munich. As an ambassador in residence, Eric contributes a Department of State perspective to the Marshall Center's mission. And I'd like to give a special congratulations because I see he has just been selected for a Presidential Rank Award for Superior Service as a U.S. Ambassador in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and quote, an impressive record of accomplishments, executive leadership, and dedication to the Department of State's mission. So Ambassador Nelson will moderate the conversation and Q&A tonight for us. You in the theater and at home can ask questions. We're gonna be using Slido again. So you can see on the screen, if you go to slido.com, hashtag America House, then you're in, and the fabulous tech team in the back will make sure that all of your questions uh, make it up to the stage. So without any further ado, it is really my great honor to turn the stage over to Professor Anna Vestad. Thank you very much, Bartley, for that wonderful, wonderful introduction. Uh, it's great to be back in Munich. I haven't been for some time, but that just reminded me of what a wonderful city this is. Uh, I want to thank the, the Dialogue on Democracy, partly, of course, first and, first and foremost, uh, the America House, who is hosting us here today, and, of course, Ambassador Nelson, who will be commenting um, and, and being part of the discussion after uh, I finish my brief remarks. So what I'm going to talk about today is uh, US-China relations in light of the Ukraine war. And I'm going to do that through three 
really four different angles, adding on what Bartley asked for, just a little bit of that at the end. So first I'm going to talk about uh, the rise of China and the significance of it. Uh, it doesn't need much talking about, but it, 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 it is important, I think, to put these things into perspective. I'm going to talk about where I see US-China relations as coming from and, and where they are going in the immediate future. I'm going to talk about the effects of Russia's attack on Ukraine. And then, as I said, a little bit about Europe and Germany. I'm going to try to do all of this in 30 minutes. I might run a couple of minutes over, but I promise it won't be more than that, so that we have time for discussion. So the rise of China is, to me, and I think to many people, the most remarkable story of our time. When I first came to the People's Republic of China as a sophomore exchange student back in 1979, China was dirt poor and terrified. It was among the poorest countries in the world. Um, if you ranked it uh, among African countries, it would come roughly two-thirds down the list in terms of GDP per capita. It had just gone through the Cultural Revolution, um, which, of course, had left people terrified of the authorities, terrified of their neighbors, um, which was one of the big disasters in, in Chinese history. So being able to turn that around within a generation and a bit, as it is now, is a remarkable feat. And it's a feat that we should applaud. It has been difficult for the Chinese to do, but with the kind of ability that many Chinese have shown, coming out of very little, to build the country into the industrial superpower that it is today, that is not negative for the world. It's a good thing for the world. Uh, it is something that I think in the longer run will serve the Chinese and serve the world better than the kind of China that I found when I, when I first came there. So that's not what this is about. Um, the challenge that we have today uh, is about finding room for China within the existing world order. And as great powers rise, that is not an easy thing to do. Um, I don't need to remind the German audience of that. Um, so finding room for China within the existing order while not accepting the kind of aggression and expansionism that you have seen the current regime in China sometimes uh, being in support of other countries' future. This is possible, but it's also very difficult, I think. Um, some people worry about the Thucydides trap. My old friend and colleague, former colleague up at Harvard, Graham Allison's term, of course, referring to the fear that the rise of Athens instilled in, in Sparta, the reigning hegemon, that it was Thucydides says at the beginning of his great book on the Peloponnesian War, that was what led to war. I don't think it is quite as simple as that. I don't think it was quite that simple with the Peloponnesian War either, for that, for that matter. Um, I like to think about China and about the Sino-American relationship in more specific contexts. This is also the reason, I think, why the Cold War comparison, which is so often used, doesn't work for me in terms of the US-China relations. Not now. And I would also be very surprised if it is actually going to work better in the future. I don't think so. This is a different kind of rivalry. It's a different kind of conflict. And the main reason for that, there are many reasons which we can discuss later, but the main reason is that these two powers coexist within the same global economic system. The United States and the Soviet Union did not. Um, the Soviet mission was to break that system in its minuscule, detailed uh, fashion and replace it with a completely new social and economic and political system. This is not the case for the United States and China. What China wants within the international system is more for China. It's for China to be accepted as a leading great power, perhaps the primary power, perhaps a power on par with the United States. And that's not the kind of Cold War scenario uh, that we had. What it does remind you of, and again, this is where Germany comes in, is the world of the late 19th century and early 20th century, where a number of powers, Germany perhaps most strikingly, but also Japan, grew to power and influence, and where the international system that they were part of did not succeed in incorporating them peacefully into the kind of system that existed. 
as you know, there is a huge debate about why that didn't happen, why that didn't succeed. But it's important, I think, to bear that comparison in mind when we think about the United States and, and China today. So when I say that this is not a Cold War, unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, that's not necessarily good news. So let me talk a little bit then about what, in my view, characterizes US-China relations today and, and where they are going in the immediate future. I think there has been a very clear increase in the rivalry between the two sides over the past decade. Um, I think that rivalry will continue to intensify, but I also think that there is a reasonable chance, at least in the short and medium run, that it can be contained. Neither of these two sides have inherently an interest in an all-out conflict with the other. Um, none of the legitimacy at home, I think, is built on that, different from what you found, in, for instance, in some countries in the late, in the late 19th century. But this could, of course, change as the rivalry overall in a number of sectors, political, trade, international diplomatic alliances, technologies, whatever, as that rivalry intensifies. China has become more assertive in terms of its foreign policy, in terms of its trade policies, its policies on technology, uh, maybe first and foremost in terms of its relationship with its immediate surrounding region more assertive over the past decade, and it has become considerably more authoritarian at home. There is no doubt about this. I mean, either of these two positions, I think, should go uncontested, because this is what we have seen. We can talk afterwards uh, about why that has been so, particularly the increase in authoritarianism within China itself. I've suggested in some of the stuff I published that I think part of the reason for that was a fear from within the Chinese Communist Party, that Chinese society and the Chinese economy was getting too liberal, a fear of losing control, that the party could no longer be in the kind of position of command that it had been earlier on. So I think there are domestic drivers in this uh, in China, just like there are, as we know, domestic drivers in this relationship in the United States. So much of the change here, and it's important to underline that, has happened on the US side, not just on the Chinese side. Um, the United States today, in terms of the attitudes of its leaders and the attitudes of its voting public, uh, is much more preoccupied looking after its own interests than what it has been for probably two generations. Um, the United States, for a very long time, after the Second World War, during and after the Second World War, saw itself as a systemic power as a power that was out to strengthen, to furnish the, the potential for a global economic and at some points also political uh, system based on, on, on liberal democracy. There are still some elements of that, as we have seen very recently in terms of US foreign policy. But it's very clear that from the mid-20-teens onwards, uh, U.S. policy turned towards its own interests in a way that we hadn't seen for a long time in U.S. in U.S. foreign policy. There were some tendencies, again, we could discuss this later on, of the same kind during the 1970s, particularly during the, the Nixon administration. But overall, the United States has been systemic, more than interest-driven. And what we're finding now is that that is no longer the case. And part of the reason for that is, of course, this fear that China is surpassing the United States economically, that China is taking advantage of the kind of liberal economic system that the United States and Britain before it had created internationally. So it's a case, a scene from many Americans, of China unfairly um, taking advantage of the system that the United States has created. And there is something to those accusations, again, we could talk about this later on. There are unfair trade practices on the Chinese side. There, is a, there has been massive theft of, of technology and, uh, and uh, property, uh, intellectual property rights on the Chinese side. Uh, but China is in no way the only country that is misbehaving in terms of international trade. 
um, the US own record on this is not always stellar, even though it has avoided the kind of excesses that we've seen from China of late. That matters less. What really matters is the sense inside the United States that things are not going well, and that foreign competition, the challenges that come up from China, um, is part of the reason why things are not going well. And it's important to bear that in mind. Where these relations really get tricky, in my view, is not so much over issues that are directly connected to trade or even ideological positions taken, for instance, on democracy, on human rights, and other issues. It is with regard to the rivalry between the two sides inside Eastern Asia, so in, in the immediate vicinity of China itself. That what worries me most in terms of future conflict, because much of this cannot be determined by either of these two great powers. Remember again the late 19th century, right? In terms of how these rivalries spun out of control. It had to do with regional rivalries. Regional rivalries back then in the continent that was by far of the most significance internationally, meaning Europe. And today, in, at least in economic terms, the pattern of rivalry is repeated in Eastern Asia, which is by far the most important and will become even more important as an economic region today. And we could run through this on a whole range of issues going from Japan to Korea to the South China Sea to um, Southeast Asia, and even through Southeast Asia to, to, to India and to, to China's borders in the Himalayas. In security terms, this area does not look good. And I think that's one of my biggest worries in terms of conflict between the United States and China. And on top of that, as we've seen, particularly over the past year and a half, there is the Taiwan issue. Now, I didn't think, I mean, even two and a half years ago, that I would stand before a, a distinguished audience in Munich and talk about the possibility for a war over Taiwan. I mean, for a very long time, Taiwan uh, and Taiwan's relationship with the mainland had been seen as eminently manageable. Right? And I still believe, or maybe it's a hope more than a belief, that it can be managed today. The only thing the two sides have to do is to restate the position that they have held ever since the early 1970s in terms of how they're going to deal with the Taiwan issue, which basically means accepting the status quo, no change, unless that change is negotiated peacefully between uh, the people of the People's Republic and the people on Taiwan. I do think uh, on both sides, but especially on the Chinese side, that this is now something that is coming into doubt. And there are strong pressures, I think, domestically in China to achieve, by hook or by crook, a reunification with Taiwan. And this worries me intensely, because if uh, military power is used in trying to provoke uh, such a, a unification, I think it could easily lead to war. And I think it's very important that, uh, especially in light of Ukraine, which I'll turn to in a moment, that the Chinese side recognizes that. So where does then the lessons of the more immediate past, the ongoing past, as it were, the last year or so, particularly with regard to Ukraine, how does that um, influence the relationship, perhaps the most important relationship in international affairs today between the United States and, and, and China? Let me stress at the outset that this was not a war that the United States or China wanted. We have absolutely no evidence of uh, the Chinese being instigators to, to this conflict in any meaningful sense, or that the United States, for that matter, was trying to push uh, Ukraine, which is what is often said, into a harsher policy towards Russia. I mean, during the early Biden administration, in many ways, the opposite uh, was the case in order to, to, avoid, to avoid conflict. So this war came out of decisions that were taken in the Kremlin and decisions that were taken by Putin himself. And I think 
there are several reasons why the attack on Ukraine took place and that the war aims developed in the direction that they have. Probably the, the main reason was a perception in the Kremlin that the West was weak and divided, that American politics was divided, uh, that the Biden administration would not be able to come up with a response, and e they were even more so, I think, that Europe would not be able to come up with a response to what happened. I think that hubris was a very significant reason, both for why the attack happened when it happened, but also uh, for why the war aims became so inflated. So for someone like me, for instance, what this means is that I wasn't surprised that Russia attacked Ukraine, but I was surprised that the seeming aim of the Russian side was to completely decapitate the, the Ukrainian state. And I think this has a lot to do with how Putin's own thinking on this has evolved over time from a position which I think he developed early on during his presidency of dominating Ukraine and also dominating other countries within the former Soviet Union to the position that he has today, which is that historically, and as it were, theoretically, Ukraine doesn't exist. Uh, Ukrainians are just another kind of, kind of Russians, although they do not realize it themselves. Right? That's basically the Putin position on Ukraine today, which is quite remarkable because it goes further than anything that we've seen from Russian side in, in, in an historical context, much further than what the Soviets claimed for their state, which was, of course, a, a state composed of many, in name, independent republics. But it also goes further than the Russian Empire. I mean, the Russian Empire, in many ways, emphasized difference, difference among the different peoples who were part of the empire. That was part of the glory of the Russian Empire, that there were all these different peoples who paid homage to the Tsar, and of course to the, to the idea of an imperial Russia that was at the center of it. But until very late in that game, uh, you know, it was very difficult, I think, to get much support for the idea that Ukrainians or, or Latvians or whoever were some other kind of Russians, and that, they, that that was their cohesion within the Russian Empire. So Putin goes further than all of this. And I think this is, um, this is what makes the situation so worrisome and what has led to um, the, the uh, terrible acts of aggression that Russia has, that Russia has carried out. China finds it difficult to deal with this in more senses than one. While China overall has solidarized with its uh, probably main friend in international affairs, Russia, it has also had misgivings about how the war has been carried out. And I think that has been, that has been clear, pretty clear. The, the problem here, of course, is that China also benefits from the war. So while Chinese leaders are worried about the long-term outcome of the war, particularly if Russia would turn to the use of weapons of mass destruction, or if Russia uh, suffers a complete military breakdown, both of which are possible, though not likely, um, China has also benefited enormously from uh, getting contracts on the cheap uh, for Russian resources, uh, for Russian energy, uh, lots of other things that China needs for its further rise. So that's the difficulty here, in a way, that China is in many ways benefiting from this war, but at the same time it's worried that it should go, it should go too far. Some of the Chinese position is also obviously influenced by the deterioration in its relationship with, you, with the United States. Uh, if that relationship had not been as bad as it was at the very beginning of the war, I think China would probably still have indirectly supported the Russians, but not been as vocal in the support of Russia as they have, as they have turned out to be. For China, I think the uh, point of balance here will be when their fears of what the war could lead to overtakes the benefit that they have from it. And unfortunately, I think that process may take a long time, unless one of these two scenarios that I already referred to uh, 
will take place. Uh, and that's very bad news, because China is probably the only country that has the potential with regard to its position in, in Russia and with Russia to end this war. And they won't do so until they think that it is in their interest to do it. And this is what then brings me to Europe and the European position uh, overall. Because the biggest casualty from a Chinese perspective in terms of the war in Ukraine so far has been not so much China's relationship with the United States, because that was bad already, and Chinese leaders thought getting worse. It is its relationship to Europe, uh, which is, as you will all know, one of the uh, main, if not the main, uh, trading partner uh, of China on a, on a global scale. And this does worry the Chinese leadership. I have been surprised that it doesn't worry them even more. I think at the moment, the sense is still there that Europe will be too disunited on such an issue, even though they have been surprised by the European support for Ukraine. They still think that on the matters that are really significant for China, uh, it's hard to imagine Europe coming together and acting against Chinese interest, for instance, on trade and investment, which I'll talk more about uh, in a second. It is very interesting now to see, in terms of public opinion, and many of you will have seen that already, how European public opinion across the continent have changed with regard to China. I mean, only uh, less than two years ago, uh, the majority of Europeans had either a balanced or a positive view of China. Now it's less than one third of the population that have these kinds of views. And of course, China's position on the war in Ukraine have played a very important role in that deterioration. So, from a, from a European perspective, what would then be the right thing to do? And I'll, I'll end on this. Uh, with regard to this relationship between China and the United States, in light of what is happening in, in Ukraine. Obviously, at least obviously to me, uh, the most important thing that Europeans can do is to prevent Russia from winning in Ukraine. So the, the worst scenario, both in terms of long-term US-China relations on a global scale and China's relationship to Europe, would be a Russian victory. However, that victory is set out in Ukraine. I think that would have a terrible effect on issues such as Taiwan. I think it would have a terrible effect overall on the political content of US-China relations. And I think it would confirm in Beijing this sense that Europe is weak and cannot look after its own interest. So preventing Russia from winning, I think, is essential for how the rela these relationships are going to develop in the future. But I don't think it's enough. I also think it is necessary uh, for Europeans to show China that Europe will not accept indirect Chinese support for Russia in a war that, in my view, is in the process of turning genocidal um, in Ukraine, while carrying out business as usual in Sino-European relations. Because that's, in a way, what the current Chinese leadership expects to happen. And it's important then to show them that that won't happen. Now, this is not easy to do, as all of you, as all of you know. Uh, there are already efforts on the way to try to change Europe's overall relationship to China, for instance, by making sectors of European um, manufacturing and, and industry overall less dependent on, on China. But I also think one needs to go further than that, particularly with regard to what I would call European national security concerns. With regard to specific products, with regard to technologies, with regard to critical infrastructure. I think both within an EU context and perhaps more importantly given how the EU works within the individual member states, including to a very high degree Germany, I think one needs to look at these things again and find ways in which one would be less dependent uh, on cooperation with China. I also think that there is a movement that is going on, not just in Europe but also elsewhere,
now to take political system much more into consideration while deciding on trade and investment. Um, sometimes referred to as friend shoring. You know, it, the, the idea uh, is that democratic and well, certainly more pluralistic countries are also more stable policy wise. So they do not have the risks that you would have while with going with dictatorships. Now, this is not easy to do. Um, I don't think we will see much of it in the immediate future. But out of the Ukraine war, it is quite possible that that idea will progress. Right? Um, that there are good reasons, at least in some cases, to open up for more trade, more investments, from countries that are not aggressive dictatorships. Right? And I think that would be a good thing. I'm not saying that we should boycott everyone who has a political system we don't like. I don't even believe that sanctions of the kind that has proved themselves, in spite of what the Russians say, quite effective against Russia, that they would necessarily work against China. But I do think that taking into consideration that maybe trade and investment should go more in the direction of countries that have political systems that are more representative, that that is probably a good idea. The main point for me on this is about trade diversification. And this is something that Europe can do something about, and do something about relatively quickly, by opening up for free access from other countries that would be strong competitors to China if they were given the same kind of market access that China now has for Europe. Um, and that, I think, is hugely important, something that can be done and, 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 and should be done. Thinking, for instance, about Latin America, which is a, a, a region that is very often overlooked in terms of European trade policy. The most important thing for me, though, in terms of what Europe can do more long term, in terms of its relationship with China, and for that matter, its relationship with other rising powers, is to look after its own economies and its own development. I think part of the problem that Europe has had, and maybe especially Germany has had for some time, has been, remarkably enough, disregarding what was one of Europe's greatest post-war strengths. And that was what was summed up, sometimes a bit unfairly, in the term industrial policy. Now, if I had mentioned industrial policy in polite company only a few years ago, uh, at least half of the audience would have tried to chase me out of the house. You know, industrial policy is so 1950s or 1960s, and it was you know, left behind. Uh, now it should really be about unfettered competition, about markets, and of course about international trade. And I'm nothing against any of those. I think they have produced fabulous levels of wealth in many Western countries. What they have not produced is a balanced manufacturing base that would provide jobs for people who grow up inside these countries themselves, inside of Europe. Technical know-how that in many ways now can only be find, found outside of Europe. Um, and of course, the ability to look after its own production chains, um, which also is not the case. It's not the case in the United States. It's not, not the case in Europe. So if we want to be able to do something about the challenges that seem to be coming from countries such as China, the best way of doing it, in my view, is not just through what we need to do in terms of international affairs. It is in terms of what we do to strengthen our own societies. Because that's in many ways where we are, where we are the furthest behind. So let me end with that. I mean, I think if we draw one lesson from the Ukraine war so far. It is that we probably need to think differently about the relationship that we have to dictator states, states that are monopolizing political power within a small group of people or one individual, not by breaking off relations with them. We are not in a position to do that, and I don't think it would be good for the world to do that in economic terms or political or diplomatic or security terms. What we need to do, just like what we needed to do two generations ago, is to strengthen our own societies so that we can compete better 
And to me, that is in many ways the best national security com policy coming out of the lessons that we can draw from, from the war in Ukraine, and for that matter also the long-term relationship between Europe, China, and the United States. So thank you very much. I'm looking forward to the discussion and to the, to the questions. Thank you, Arna. We, we could have listened to you for at least another hour. And in the next half hour, we're going to take some questions from the audience. As Bartley mentioned, we have two online tools available. One is slido.com, where uh, just going on to slido.com and hashtag America House, you can submit your question. And also, we're on YouTube Live, so everyone watching us on YouTube can uh, submit a question in the comments section, and we have moderators here who are helping us keep track of those. Uh, to my request to the audience is, uh, I'm sure every question is a better phrased than the next, but it's uh, helpful to look for the stream of questions and, and vote up the ones that you're thinking about, rather than having a massive competition among, among questions. So, while everyone is thinking about what they'd like to ask you. Um, let me start and uh, probe a little bit about your, your closing thoughts, that what's, what's going to be key for the West is that we increase our resilience. And I think that for the US, the, uh, President Biden's national security strategy, which, which was just uh, published in October, uh, focused a lot on strategic competition. Of course, we saw in the interim strategy uh, published earlier, it was very much about China. And the final strategy, of course, is much as much about, about Russia. But what the US is talking about is, the beginning is, is investment. Mm -hmm. That for us to compete with China, we have to invest at home. The second uh, priority is alignment that we recognize that we have to align with, with our friends. And the third is, is competition, that we will always be competing with, with China. And in fact, we prefer to be competing than in conflict. Do you think that, would you say the national security strategy is set enough? And is that going to do enough for the US to um, internalize the changes that we need to accomplish? So, so broadly speaking, I agree with the direction of the most recent uh, full national security strategy. Uh, it would be even better, by the way, if it had appeared a year ago <laughs> rather, than, <laughs> rather than just now, because I, I think it is important to set the, the future direction of US policy on, this, on these issues. I do think, though, particularly in the part that deals with with resilience or deals with uh, the rebuilding, which is the term that's also used, of American industrial capacity at home, one needs to go much further than what is outlined in the, in the national security strategy. What, what I'd like to see is, in a much more concrete way than the administration has been able to do so far, we, we don't know what they will do in their second term if, if re-elected, uh, to create the kind of links that need to exist between private enterprise and the overall purposes that the administration want to put American power to at home and, and, and abroad. And I think that's what has been lacking. Now, it is not easy to do. Um, it will, in some areas, I think, be politically unpopular to try to do more of a, a government steer uh, on what American business should be up to. As you will know, uh, at most times, this has not been a popular policy in the United States. But there have been exceptions to that, right? So during the height of the Cold War, uh, the American government was remarkably involved in many ways in trying to steer the direction of what I would then call an American industrial policy. Right? And of course, during the two world wars, you saw the United States probably doing this better than any other country on Earth. Right? So there are precedents for doing this, and I think this is the kind of moment uh, 
And I'm not thinking about doing this as a kind of panic in terms of the relationship to China, but to do it over time, to use those instruments that are available to create a reasonable base for industrial production of strategic products at home. I mean, I would have, I would have argued for the benefit of that under any circumstance. I mean, even if China didn't exist, right? Or the war in Ukraine hadn't happened. Uh, because I think it is really important when you think about the longer term future. It also is probably a good thing for the United States in terms of how it works domestically. Uh, I think it will help, it, it won't be a panacea for this, but it will, it will help with creating more stability in terms of economic development at home. And mind you, final point on this, I, you know, I, I'm not suggesting that the United States move in the direction of an overblown uh, government-dependent state-subsidized domestic sector. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is attempting to steer resources, steer credits, public and private, in the direction where the United States would do well in terms of production. That's what this is about, not, not you know, the kind of government subsidies that, or, or, or government takeovers that have failed in the past. You talked about the weak industrial policy also in Europe, or the weak energy policy. Yes. Um, it's argued that uh, Germany didn't have an energy policy for years, except let's, buy, let's get gas cheap. And that's uh, contributed to a lot of the problems. But I think of the 5G development as a prime example of a, uh, the lack of U.S. leadership, where U.S. industrial coordination, strategic coordination, um, led to the construction of the, the Internet and, and many other breakthrough um, advances. Yes. But I think since Reagan's presidency, there's been a strong tendency in America that, or belief that government will, will not help business move forward. And what you're talking about is finding that, that, that balance, which I think this administration is seeking with, the, with big spending pr programs like uh, the CHIPS Act and, yes. and some of the infrastructure and the climate spending. Our, our audience is asking, when, when you talk about the need to strengthen societies, mm. um, we've talked about economically. What else does that mean? What, what, what are the social impl implications or, or the other n n uh, needs? So I think there are many ways in which this could happen. I mean, I think I'm first and foremost thinking about jobs. I'm thinking about the future for young people. That, um, and this is <laughs> as important for Europe, of course, more important in, in parts than what it is for the United States. Um, to give people back this sense that if you act in a proper way, meaning that you, you train, uh, for a particular kind of job, then we would have a reasonable chance of actually getting a job within that sector. So I might not think here about people who study philosophy like I did when I was an undergraduate. <laughs> but I'm thinking about people who want to, you know, learn a trade, um, get, a, uh, get a degree in a, in a three-year or four-year college, uh, you know, um, that there should be the opportunity of, for, for, for doing that. That, to me, is the most important aspect of um, rebuilding society. Uh, because it has to do with fundamental economic fairness. Right? This idea that it's not only the rich who should benefit from a thriving economy. And of course, in Europe especially, if we look at the immediate post-war period, uh, Europeans were incredibly good at doing this, right? Germans especially, right? Uh, the German economic miracle was built on that principle, that if you were willing to work, and if you were willing to be increasingly highly trained within what you were supposed to do, you would get a full-time, well-paying job that will see your, you, yourself and your families well off into the future. Um, from the 1970s and up to today, that link has been broken. And I think it's really important to, to re-establish it. Uh, it's difficult because there are pressures in all kinds of directions that have taken us in, 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 in a different, on a different trajectory than this. But I do think that's an important issue. Let me mention two others just very briefly. So um, one has to do with 
public service. And I think about public service in a sort of very broad sense, from willingness to participate in various forms of public enterprise, in politics or, or, or whatever, but also through what we used to call national service of various kinds. Um, so I do not celebrate the fact that for many generations of mainly young men, but also increasingly young, young women, uh, a military service was necessary in, in, in Europe and other countries. But I do think it delivered something in terms of a national cohesion and, 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 and a national sense of purpose. Um, I think we should reconsider how we can use those kinds of instruments. Um, and, then, and then finally, I do, going back to what I said in my talk, I do think it is important in terms of rebuilding societies to think about what kind of relationship we want to have with the outside world. So, you know, receiving refugees is a very important part of this, incorporating them well into the societies that they come into. But equally important is having a view of what kind of trade arrangements with other countries and with other parts of the world actually serve your own people and the people you're trading with well. And we haven't always been good enough at doing that. And I'm not talking protectionism. I mean, this is not about protectionism. Protectionism is bad. But it is about thinking, you know, how do you develop things at home in a positive direction? Open up a potential for that sectors of your own economy can rise at the same time as the industrial sector of the countries that you're tra trading with. And that, I think, is important to get back to when it comes to revitalizing societies at home. Arnie, you mentioned that two and a half years ago you wouldn't have thought that we'd be talking about Taiwan and um, thinking about is will there be a next conflict around Taiwan when the secret of Taiwan and stability is that we, as you said, we just keep the status quo. Yes. Um, the question from the audience is, does the, the uh, unity and um, um, rapidity of the... West's response to uh, Putin's war on, on Ukraine, do you think, is that not enough to give China second thoughts? Um, or are they, is this too sensitive an issue when the Speaker of the House of the US can, can visit Taiwan and, and uh, rock the boat enough that mm. they're responding with some military m maneuvers? So I do think that the much more unified and expected uh, European and US reaction to the invasion of Ukraine has made Taiwan more secure. Uh, I think first and foremost that the incredible heroism of the Ukrainian people have helped making Taiwan more secure. Uh, I think anyone uh, at least in the immediate future, who would think about attacking a smaller country with an ability to defend itself. And make no mistake, Taiwan has the ability to defend itself to a much higher degree uh, than even Ukraine had before it was invaded. Of course, the discrepancy in terms of relative power between Taiwan and China is even greater than the one between Russia and, and Ukraine, probably based on what we can see on paper. But that's not the same thing as saying that, that Taiwan cannot defend itself. So I do think that that has been positive in the short run. I do think it's important to avoid any kind of provocation that would lead in the direction of a military conflict. I do not think that Speaker Pelosi's visit to Taiwan when it happened was a good idea um, because it achieved very little, except making um, the confrontation from the Chinese side even, even stronger. Uh, what is needed is very strong signals, very robust signals, probably going even further than what we have seen so far, um, especially from the United States, but also from European countries, as to you know, what an unmitigated disaster a Chinese attempt to take over Taiwan by force would, would be. Um, I'm not arguing for the United States moving away from what's often referred to a slightly bad, sort of not cool term, as strategic ambiguity. In other words, not, not telling the Chinese what the United States uh, 
uh, would, would, would do in case of an all-out PRC attack on Taiwan. But the point at the moment, and this is what worries me, is that this Chinese leadership, particularly the one that was elected at the past, uh, the, the, the recent party congress, their 20th congress, um, there seems to be people who actually do not believe uh, that it's likely that the United States would come to the aid of Taiwan in case of an invasion. Uh, and we should try to dissuade them from that notion. Um, not by giving up strategic ambiguity, but by showing both in terms of what happens um, almost daily in the waters around Taiwan that the United States is prepared for all eventualities in terms of such a military strike, military action, but also politically and diplomatically to signal that the United States has the will, the cohesion, the ability to act against China in case such a, an invasion was attempted. So it is difficult, this, as you will know. I mean, it is an incredibly difficult balance. Um, and I'm hopeful that this administration over time will get it right. But I also think it is really important to convince the Chinese that from their own position, from Beijing's own position, an invasion of Taiwan would be a really bad idea. So the next question is about uh, when we see Russia and China trying to change the world order, whether that's through naked aggression um, or, uh, or assaults on international norms or um, further influence, uh, negative influence in UN and other international organizations, what, what's, what can the US and, and Europe actually do to prevent that? To keep the world order, the values-based world order that, um, that's important to us? It's a, it is a difficult question. I mean, in terms of the way the, as you will know better than me, the international organizations were set up, the global international organizations were set up after the Second World War, they are supposed to operate in a certain way, emphasizing sovereignty over other kinds of, of rights uh, within, the, within the global community. It's very hard to move away from that, right? Um, China and Russia are both members of the UN Security Council. There have been some people who have suggested that maybe that could be changed. I don't believe so. I think it, we would end up in a much more dangerous world uh, than what we have today if there were attempts at changing um, their presence within the, the veto-capable body of the, of the UN. Um, I do think that working more closely with friends and allies in terms of these global institutions is a, is a good idea. Um, we're doing reasonably well on that, but still could do better. Um, and some of that leadership, by the way, should come from Europe, not just from the United States. Uh, but it can't be just Europe and the United States. It also has values. And of course, the ability then to carry out the program that these countries agree on within international institutions. And here I'm thinking about you know, things far beyond your security policy, climate change, uh, international health issues, uh, migration issues, inequality, global inequality issues, lots of these things that probably could be dealt with better if we had better coordination among countries that do not necessarily see eye to eye on all of these issues, but at least have the democratic political uh, system in place, so that when they agree to move, it will actually be supported by the majority of their uh, majority of their population. Uh, so I do think that's important. But I would also return to this issue of, um, you know, in my view, what is the most important thing that we can do for the democracy for democracy abroad? Well, it is to strengthen democracy at home, uh, and I think we've seen this now in Europe. In many European countries, and we've seen it in the United States most spectacularly um, during, the, during the Trump administration, um, how dangerous it is when these countries are divided against themselves. It's dangerous politically for their own democratic systems, but it's also immensely dangerous for people elsewhere in the world who would aspire to have these kinds of political institutions themselves. Because when the Chinese, and this was, you know, you still find it from the Chinese side, but they, they could really make hay on it during the, during the last US administration. 
when the Chinese are trying to say that democracy is chaotic, democracy doesn't work. Right? Democracy sets people against each other. It leads to violence and it leads to you know, inability to act on important social issues. Right? But unfortunately, we've given them quite a bit to go on. Right? So uh, that's to me the most important thing in terms of what can be done in terms of the institutional level, uh, domestically and internationally, is to, is to strengthen democracy at home. And that, of course, starts at the polling booth. I mean, that starts in terms of people's votes and people's voting intentions. Um, I think we have time for one, one more question. And um, I'm going to choose a question that's been voted up, although as U.S. ambassador, it's not one I would want to be fielding, so I'm going to let... I'm glad you're going to field this. <laughs> uh, um, this must be very, very difficult indeed. <laughs> well, the question is, if, if, Germany and, if Germany has to choose sides mm. between the U.S. and China, how would they do that and what would be the U.S. response? From my point of view, I, I, I think that's hard to imagine mm. that that's an equal choice set. So I'd like to hear your thoughts about why that's seen as um, uh, a, a real trade-off in these circumstances. Mm. But to, maybe we can expand the question, mm. too, to some of the more ambivalent partners, mm. like Serbia and Turkey. Yes. Um, what, how do you see it playing out if Serbia and Turkey uh, don't play a, a productive role that, as Brussels and Washington expect? Mm. I, I think that's actually quite a good question on a set of questions. I mean, I think until the Ukraine invasion took place, I think for many Europeans, maybe especially many Germans, and this has deep historical roots, as you will know, there was this sense that Germany's role uh, in an increasingly tense relationship between the United States and China was to act as a balancer. Was to, was to act in terms of making sure that overall tensions between these great powers uh, were reduced. I mean, this is a policy that, of course, goes back in German history to the detente era, to Ostpolitik, to the various positions that were taken during the latter stage of the Cold War, which in many ways paid off. Right? Now, I think the situation after the invasion of Ukraine is different. It's also different perceptually for many people. Um, the um, ideas that, and we, we see this from, from, from polling data, the, the ideas that people now pick up from the past, probably not entirely incorrectly, is not so much with the Cold War and with Germany's position, West Germany's position back then, uh, in terms of working closely with the United States, but also having more of an open policy towards the East. Um, it's not so much that as it is the interwar period and the period before the First World War that I mentioned earlier on. And that's, of course, a heck of a difference in terms of perceptions. Right? Um, that for many people now, this is about naked aggression that cannot, under any circumstance, be rewarded. Now, it will be interesting to see how this will play out with regard to China. In many ways, I think that the ball is in China's court on this. So if the Chinese leadership insists on, as it's done so far, to put this very bluntly, as you know, trying to alienate Europeans as best they can in terms of the rhetoric with regard to what caused the Russian invasion and uh, the provocations that led the innocent Russians to invade Ukraine. Uh, I think that question will in a way answer itself. I mean, it, it's impossible under those kinds of circumstances for any European who has any sense of this continent's troubled past to take a sort of in-between position between China and, and the United States of China or China's opponents, you know, internationally. Will there be a need to continue to trade with China? Absolutely. And I'm in no way saying that, uh, as I said in my talk as well, that, that a sensible German policy or sensible European policy would be to boycott China in terms of its economy. It won't work. The Chinese economy is too big and it would be inflicting much deeper wounds in Europe than what it would at least to fir uh, at first in China. The point is getting a more sensible trade policy and investment policy along the lines that I talked about in my, in my talk. I do think uh, 
that with regard to the, the, the countries that you mentioned, Ambassador Nelson, with regard to the issues of particularly Western Balkans, but possibly also other countries uh, uh, now within the European Union, uh, it is really important to bear in mind that the policy for a, for a very long time uh, on the Chinese side has been to find those points in Europe uh, in which it would be most easy to cooperate on China's conditions. Like, this is not something nefarious. All countries do this in terms of how they conduct their international affairs. But if you are within a deeply integrated, and hopefully further integrating, uh, institution like the European Union, you have to be very watchful of these kinds of things, right? Uh, and how are you watchful? Well, <laughs> you are watchful by extending the kind of cooperation to these countries, the kind of opportunities to these countries, that some people there, Turkey to, to Serbia, um, believe that they can get, bet get better from the Chinese. It's really as simple as that. Um, you know, this is, this is not foreign policy rocket science. I mean, you know, these countries, I think, every single of them, including Turkey, would, would much rather have a decent uh, trade uh, relationship, a, 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 recent, a decent close relationship in terms of its economy and, and various other sectors with Europe than what it would with China, if given a choice. Um, but some of the developments inside the European Union over the past decade, almost decade and a half, have made that less likely. Right? Um, so I'm not saying that one should rush to membership for these countries, overlook all the other challenges that are there. In Turkey's case, as many people will know here, even if you know, some kind of trajectory towards EU membership was on offer, I don't think the Turks would take it in their current mode. Um, so that's not the issue. The issue is about going back to what I said at the end of my talk, to open up the possibilities for these countries to feel that they are included into what will become a rising European economy. That's the, that's the key issue, to give them those kinds of opportunities, um, which I believe more uh, long-term or even medium-term, Europe can deliver better than what China can. I'm not among those who believe that the Chinese economy at the moment is in fantastic shape. I think it has some very clear points of weakness, and I think some of those weaknesses are created by the current Chinese leadership itself. So it's not given, and I think many smart people in the Western Balkans, for instance, have started to realize this, it's not given that China will be, in economic terms, at least in global economic terms, um, a full-fledged alternative to near partners of, in, in the way that many people there probably saw it to be in a, a decade ago. So maybe things are not all that problematic with regard to this as we sometimes imagine. But let me just make that final point. I think all of this depends on how we are able to develop our own economies and our own societies. It's, that's the only thing that will enable Europe to develop in a better fashion with regard to giving opportunities for others. Absolutely no doubt about that. That's what European history since 1945 has shown with, with, with stellar clarity. Uh, and that's what I think we need to get back to. Thank you very much, Professor Vestad. On behalf of our global audience, we have Yale alumni and as well as Marshall Center alumni from around the world also participating tonight. Thank you so much for your time with us. It's always good to see you here in Munich. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is this back on? Um, so before we go, uh, first of all, I guess this goes to our mission here. We all need to engage. And so I'm really thankful that you all came and that you're part of the conversation. Um, I would like to, to uh, invite you to, enjoy our, in, to join our community if you haven't yet on our website, dialoguesondemocracy.com. That just gets you email information about our future events. Um, I'd also like to take uh, some time tonight to thank specific people by name. And Dr. Mike Zwingenberger is the executive director of America House. And Dominic Rabe and Milena Paschat in the program department worked with me to make this evening possible. And of course, the tech team in the back who keep the live stream and the Slido and the lights and the cameras and everything going, you guys are rock stars. And um, our Zusammenarbeit has, is truly a pleasure with all of you guys and I am really grateful. Thank you. <laughs>
So I keep, I keep saying this, but Munich Dialogues on Democracy is an all-volunteer operation, and we run on generous support from our partners at America House Munich and from you. So to all of the members who have donated this year to make our, event, our events possible, my gratitude. And a final two special mentions, um, a thank you to the Melior Foundation for their generosity and support and interest in promoting transatlantic and pro-democracy initiatives. And I would be remiss if I didn't thank the Yale Alumni Association tonight because they were very generous in specifically helping us to get Professor Westud physically here tonight. So <laughs> if you like what we're doing, I hope you might think about including us in your year-end philanthropy miss, uh, mix. Our next event will be in February with the New Yorker's Joshua Yaffa, who spent 10 years living in Moscow and he spent the last 10 months in Ukraine reporting, so that one will be a good one. I encourage you to watch our website and America House's website for details. We post simultaneously. And now we have books that Arna is happy to sign, and I hope you can join us for a glass of wine in the foyer. And I say Merry Christmas to everybody. Thanks. Thank